Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring science and the supernatural. With me is Professor Jorge Ferrer, who is the uh, core faculty member in the program of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is author of several books, including Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, a participatory vision of human spirituality. He also co-edited an anthology called The Participatory Turn, Spirituality, Mysticism, and Religious Studies, and most recently, Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Essays in Psychology, Education, and Religion. Welcome, Jorge. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. You've approached these topics as a transpersonal psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is sort of right on the boundary of, mm, yes. of science. Transpersonal psychology sometimes is, is couched as a science mm -hmm. and sometimes not. Sometimes transpersonal psychologists say we, we definitely don't want to go there. <laughs> that, that thinking of ourselves in scientific terms is a step backwards, not forwards. Mm, that's interesting. Um, I would say that most transpersonal psychologists, including myself, are are pro science. Are like we, we really support scientific studies of uh, spiritual and transpersonal phenomena. Mm -hmm. What many of us, and here is where the divide uh, happens, many of us are not so happy with, um, you know, the ideology of scientism that is very different from actual scientific practice. Scientism, yes, like the religion of science, exactly, mm -hmm. and scientific Scientism, scientism and the, the religion of science is that religion that basically ties scientific practice to a particular worldview, a metaphysical worldview that is kind of known as scientific naturalism. Yes. That means the only thing that exists is the world of nature that can be studied empirically by science. Mm -hmm. And the rest is not natural or supernatural, and uh, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that would include uh, inner experiences. But gradually, it seems to me, science has been encroaching on on that territory. I mean, going back, for example, to Freud, who said, let's mm -hmm. study dreams scientifically. Yes. I would say that there is different types of naturalism, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is like more types types that uh, they include and they embrace inner experience and states of consciousness as as realities, as mental realities, you know. And there are the more hardcore forms that they say that even all those experiences can be ultimately reduced to uh, brain or material dynamics yes. of the brain, mm -hmm. or even more to uh, dynamics of kind of like. Or subatomic level, you know, mm -hmm. physicalism. Yes. That's physicalism, you know. So you have all this spectrum of doctrines in science, mm -hmm. like about how much to reduce and what is natural and what is not natural. Mm -hmm. But I would say that most most philosophers and even scientists would accept that you know uh, the reality of mental states has been real, but how to understand them is different. Be because primarily, yeah, at least let's say go back 50 years from now, any analysis of unusual mental states would automatically uh, bring up a discussion of psychopathology. Correct. And this is one of the things, I believe, that uh, one of the achievements of transpersonal psychology, you know, to really help to change that kind of ethos, pathologizing mm -hmm. ethos of different states of consciousness mm -hmm. that does not fit with our uh, accepted as normal or ordinary. Binary. And that was a very important achievement. Also, anthropology and cross-cultural psychology also was helpful here, but transpersonal psychology, I think, did more than any other discipline mm -hmm. in that regard. Because in anthropology, if we go back, um, I don't know, several decades, mm -hmm. uh, it was assumed that shamans were basically schizophrenics who had yes. found a, a position in their particular society. Yes, and mystics also, like, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, 19th century psychiatry would treat like some of the most famous mystics, like Santa Teresa or Saint Joanna, people who 
were pretty pretty crazy, you know, mm-hmm. and they had like this, and they had these diagnostics for them, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and this is a very interesting area, but it's because it's not that's not to say that there is not like an overlap at times between uh, psychopathology and mysticism, mm-hmm. between true spirituality and certain psychopathological tendencies. If you look at the history and the biographies, you know, of a lot of saints and mystics from Ramakrishna, you know, from mm-hmm. Ramana Maharshi, from many, many people, you, you see certain overlaps. So things are not just um, black or white. <laughs> right. It would be a little too simplistic to yes. say that, oh, this is an example of schizophrenia. Oh, yes. There might be a schizophrenic element to it, but much more. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, in many cases, obviously, like, uh, you know, the, the elements that were pathological, they were super well integrated later in the life of the saint and the mystics. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, it helped them to, to become like, um, you know, uh, more evolved and integrated human beings, you know, when you integrate certain... Especially if they have a supportive community uh, around them. Well, uh, I think the real problem goes back to uh, David Hume, Uh this Scottish philosopher who uh, put it very bluntly. He said, if anybody ever makes a claim Mm -hmm. that they have witnessed something supernatural, the safest thing is to assume that they're either lying or deluded. (laughs) Because supernatural, in a natural world, things, supernatural things do not occur. Exactly. And mm-hmm. this was like, a, I mean, it was a process that took centuries, you know, to really uh, root in the Western uh, philosophical and scientific ethos, you know, because for many years, like uh, even in those centuries, science was advancing perfectly with, uh, you know, re- within the context of religious worldviews, like yes. Newton, belief in God, you mm-hmm. know. And, Newton uh, was an alchemist. <laughs> yes, and was an alchemist, right? Yeah. So what happened, especially in the 17th century, is that uh, a lot of scientific considerations uh, also kind of what interrelated with also commercial interests, mm-hmm. you know. And this is like an important factor that I think, especially today, that we have this uh, huge climate crisis, it's important to bring on this awareness because uh, what happened in those times is like uh, you know the world before the scientific revolution before the dis- before the disenchantment of the world you know was considered an anima mundi the world itself was considered to be permeated by meaningfulness, by interiority, by divinity, mm-hmm. like indigenous people consider yeah. the world, and many contemporary moderns mm-hmm. uh, people are starting to consider the world again, you know. But that kind of world uh, did not fit well with commercial interests, because from a world that is the anima mundi, you just cannot take at whim and will, you know. But from a world that is dead, yeah. from a world that is dead and emptied, or uh, completely void of meaningfulness and divinity, you can just, it's a world that you can recklessly exploit Mm -hmm. uh, for commercial interests. So there was like a big also uh, commercial uh, impetus uh, shaping the opinions of many of the key ideologues in the Royal Society of London at that time. In in other words, for the purpose of exploiting the natural resources of the earth, it became necessary to uh, let go of any idea that of animism, meaning everything is alive. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what is being called the disenchantment of the world, right? Yes. That we're still living, and most people still live today in a disenchanted world. A world that is meaningless, except any meaning that we can produce in our brains as human mm-hmm. beings, and is considered projected into the world in yeah. our relationships, you know. And it's a very sad worldview. And in <laughs> fact, if, if pushed to it, it's a extremes where which some people seem to be doing mm-hmm. these days it's like we don't even care about our own children or grandchildren what kind of a world we're leaving for them exactly it leads to a kind of like cynicism it leads to depression it leads to a sense of meaninglessness you know so many people when they age they say well what's 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 my father is aging now he's yeah. 82 and when i see him his worldview is uh, materialistic atheistic and mm-hmm. and you know there is like it's nothing for me and just my body is, is going and you know, yeah. you know it's it's very sad to mm-hmm. see that well it can be very sad in indeed uh, no people uh, 
close to me, for mm -hmm. example, uh, who lived in the business world all mm -hmm. their life. They're chasing a dollar mm -hmm. their entire life, which was admirable, especially when you have to support a family. Mm -hmm. But but then towards the end of their life, if business conditions are bad and they suffer yes. a business failure, mm -hmm. uh, they take it personally. They think that that means that they yes. have failed be exactly. because that was their value system exactly yeah. exactly but returning to the to the you know the division between the natural and the supernatural you know yes. i think it's important to understand that that division uh, was a division that emerged in medieval times you know mm -hmm. and uh, it had to do with uh, you know people would divide monsters for example between natural monsters mm -hmm. and the supernatural that they were sent by the devil mm -hmm. <laughs> or they would divide like a things that would happen in the world as natural and supernatural and that were the miracles of God, yeah. okay? So that was the division came from, you know? And then, like, but today has been, like, really, um, it kind of, like, uh, became, like, this thing, like, well, anything that uh, empirical science cannot really sense with its technology or we mm -hmm. cannot see in our normal, normal state of consciousness, you know, uh, that, that doesn't exist, you know, that's supernatural and we need, like, to dismiss yeah. it, you know, and that's problematic well, in it's, many ways. Well, it's understandable in the sense that there's a lot of nonsense being Abs promoted. Exactly. I, I know, for example, recently we've had many big hurricanes mm -hmm. yes. and and there are some christian leaders who have said that uh, it's not global warming that's responsible for these storms it's homosexuality oh god yeah. <laughs> unbelievable yeah. homosexuality god is punishing us because we tolerate homosexuality yes, exactly. or god is punishing us because some people aren't mm -hmm. obeying all of the religious laws yes absolutely mm -hmm. you know i got half a lot of that's why in part I have a lot of empathy and sympathy for for people like my own brother you know who who um, is a professor in sociology and lives in a very beautiful man but lives in a very materialistic worldview mm -hmm. so for him talking about anything that smells supernatural is like that's regressive because it feels for him that we're regressing to kind of medieval times with all the superstition yeah. craziness all that is kind of opening the door for all that mm -hmm. and i think i don't think that's necessarily the case you know i think that there is ways in which uh, we can apply good doses of discernment you know and and, cre mm -hmm. and, and, and standards of critical inquiry you know to discern between um, certain kind of forms of like uh, visions for example yeah. and others and uh, or claims different kind of claims yeah. both well, do you think the faith? scientific method <clears throat> can be used to distinguish between an authentic spiritual claim like spiritual beings appearing and manifesting and performing healings uh, which I believe you've witnessed, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a superstition. Well, I would say that the scientific method, uh, as many people are today uh, working towards, they're um, they're trying to extend extend uh, scientific principles to be able to study those 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 yeah. phenomena. You know, mm -hmm. I think the scientific method, as it is applied today in most kind of uh, modern scientific universities and research labs, yeah. I don't think will be able to succeed. But you can apply certain principles like intersubjectivity, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and like have like collaborations like of different people, even perhaps also moving beyond the kind of like a very ethnocentric nature of Western science mm -hmm. and invite collaborators from other cultures and mm -hmm. worldviews like healers and uh, or Buddhist monks, you know, and working collaborations with scientists and philosophers, you know, and perhaps like, um, you know, going into situations, for example, example with you know um, psychedelic plants you know that mm -hmm. uh, reportedly and demonstrably in many ways like produce visions that can be intersubjectively shared mm -hmm. by different people so in that particular cases you know it's um, it's kind of for me it's kind of interesting it's like a challenge I've put there to to modern uh, traditionistic scientists you know like it's it's easy to dismiss like let's say uh, ayahuasca vision mm -hmm. when it happens with your eyes 
closed and people are in an inner journey, you know. Whenever it happens to an individual with their eyes, or eyes closed, it's going to be easily dismissed. Well, that's just the brain producing an hallucination, right? Mm -hmm. That but would be the standard. Uh, standard response, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's, like a, it's like a conversation stopper. Mm -hmm. And surely, I mean, that needs to be taken into account. Absolutely. The, these uh, entheogens are affecting the uh, neurons. A absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we know that the brain, like the example of dreams, can produce yeah. very a lot of very, you know, like mm -hmm. vivid images and stories and so But on. I have to tell you this. Mm -hmm. um, not long ago, we had um, the neurosurgeon, Eben Alexander, mm -hmm. here, and he pointed out that there's some very interesting research now on mm -hmm. psychedelics yes. that say that what's actually going on is not that the brain is being activated by these drugs, but mm -hmm. just the opposite. Mm -hmm. The brain is being turned off. Yes. The brain is being quieted so that consciousness is able to, in his view, f experience things directly independent of the brain. Exactly. That the brain functions as a filter. Yes. And when the brain uh, is quieted down so it's not filtering out, then uh, uh, this extraneous, supposedly extraneous information, then uh, we open up. I mean, in his case, it was mm -hmm. very drastic. His brain was completely shut down mm -hmm. by an attack of uh, mm -hmm. meningitis in That's the uh, uh, cerebral cortex. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he had a full-blown near-death experience, extremely profound. He felt he was in communion with the God force of the universe, yes. as he put it. But he didn't mean that in a dogmatic sense. And the sun. Yes. At, at all. So uh, it, it may be quite the opposite of what people mm -hmm. uh, assume. I, I agree. Like um, this is, as you know, is like the filter theory of psychedelics yeah. that has like a long pedigree. You know, like from one of the fathers of parapsychology and psychology. What was his name? Uh, Remember now, you know, but Henry Bergson also, yes. Aldous Huxley, you know, yes. this Houston Smith, you know, mm -hmm. Stanislav Grof plays with this theory. And I think it really makes sense. And I think what contemporary science is now doing is like to provide evidence that that might be the case, you know. Aldous also providing evidence that there is a lot of greater connectivity in the brain, yeah. for example, with LSD and so forth, you know. But my point was like, uh, what, when, when, what if and what when, yeah. uh, it, we have like three, four, people with their eyes open mm -hmm. uh, seeing the same phenomena that uh, would be considered supernatural, like energy fields, uh, balls of energy, even entities that entities and, they can, in and they can even interact with them yes. in different ways. And mm -hmm. this happens for one to three hours, you yeah. know. Uh, how how a materialistic scientist respond to that challenge? Well, it, <laughs> as a parapsychologist, yes. I can tell you that this is a problem that came up well over a hundred years ago <laughs> during uh, the 19th century. There was a huge fad all over North America, South America, and Europe called spiritualism. And right. people were getting together in, in their living rooms or their parlors and mm -hmm. having seances. And in the seances, you would have a wide variety of mm -hmm. uh, altered states of consciousness mm -hmm. and actual physical mm -hmm. phenomena, plus yes. apparitions, that, yes. you know, uh, where they might be seen. There are many examples of mm -hmm. apparitions seen by multiple people. Yes. Uh, going back, so, so there's a tradition in psychical research, mm -hmm. as it was then called, to how do we investigate these things yes. scientifically? And uh, they made enormous progress, mm -hmm. and in, in that group of people, People were leading scientists mm -hmm. of that era, William James, mm -hmm. for example, several Nobel laureates, mm -hmm. uh, presidents of the society, uh, the Royal Scientific Society mm -hmm. in England. But uh, ironically, mm -hmm. um, I don't know that uh, there's a single department mm -hmm. of psychical research or parapsychology, mm -hmm. certainly not in any university mm -hmm. here in North America. Mm -hmm. I think there might be some hints of mm -hmm. that in, in England and in, <laughs> and in Europe, but it, even transpersonal psychology mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. still has mm -hmm. a, established only a few academic outposts, I would yes, say. Yes, yes. It's growing. It mm -hmm. has been growing, especially internationally. But I think, uh, yeah, I think like, uh, yeah, you're right, like, uh, contemporary transpersonal psychology is interested in this phenomenon of shared visions, you know. Mm -hmm. I think probably we'll have much to learn from that literature that we're, yeah. most of us are not familiar with. I mean, we have 150 years yes. of scientific yes. investigation. 
creation yes. into the most exotic yes, phenomenon huh? by some of the brightest yes. minds mm -hmm. of their generation, and mm -hmm. yet it's largely ignored. Yes, yes. And for me, what gets me excited uh, about this possibility, like bringing kind of like a, you know, entheogens or psychedelic plants into, into research, and of yes. course, this needs to be done in a way that is sanctioned by mm -hmm. the government or in plain countries in which it's perfectly legal. But uh, what made me excited is that they, they, they are they are they could be pretty reliable mm -hmm. you know i mean uh, in producing visions you know and uh, could yeah. be more researchable in a systematic way well that you know. is actually part of a program mm -hmm. that uh, one of my professors uh -huh. charlie tart yes in 1973 published an essay that in science That's right. magazine the mainstream publication of the american association for the advancement of science mm -hmm. it was called state specific science and yes. he argued that scientists should be trained mm -hmm. to enter into specific altered states of consciousness yes. to conduct research in those states to see what they observe. Exactly. And, uh, psychedelics would be one example. Mm -hmm. It could also be lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. It could be out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There is even a suggestion of, well, out-of-body experience takes us very close to near-death mm -hmm. e right. experience. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, mm -hmm. Now there are many scientists, such as yourself, mm -hmm. who have decades of experience in mm -hmm. meditation. They're mm -hmm. not doing, you know, the superficial kind of mm -hmm. uh, introspection mm -hmm. that, that was done in the early days of mm -hmm. psychology. It's mm -hmm. years of training. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've always been very supportive and excited about Charlie's, Charlie's program, you know, state, you know, science of state of consciousness, you know. And at the same time, like, um, you know, looking back from when he proposed that program to our contemporary times, yeah. you don't see that so many research programs were launched in that particular framework, you know. That's right. And, um, I think part of the problem is that, uh, it takes many, many years for, for example, meditators to even stabilize their consciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. Not to speak about the number of years, perhaps even a lifetime for meditators to really go into a place of visionary mm -hmm. walls, you know, that like, for example, in Tibetan or Kabbalistic, you know, it takes like Olympic, Olympic, uh, high meditators to yes. go there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so in that particular way, I'm more optimistic about like the use of like the, you know, the, very, you know, cautious use of like, uh, psychedelics, you know, mm -hmm. plants, uh, because they produce the effects much more faster. <laughs> well, I, as I recall, in the early years, Timothy Leary or Richard mm -hmm. Alpert referred to psychedelics as a microscope, That's right. letting us look directly into consciousness itself. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But for me, like coming back to our topic, is like uh, these uh, these visions, uh, and if well documented somehow, yeah. it can really raise some interesting challenge to uh, the this kind of. Um, naturalistic metaphysics that uh, our contemporary science has really bought into, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and in a way it's kind of like weird because on we have on the one hand science operating with these very narrow metaphysical assumptions, yeah. you know, this is what exists, and then from all other fields, you know, we're now being told that the brain, the human brain is, is kind of like built in a way to uh, be able to uh, access like seven or eight dimensions, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. what we're being told now. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know, right? <laughs> yeah. And we're like on a string theories, of course, they're telling us that, that in order for the numbers to, to, to fit together well, we live in a cosmos that is multidimensional. Yes. And of course, they, dis they discuss the number of extra dimensions, yeah. right? With seven, nine, someone took out 21, right? Uh -huh, yeah. And, uh, and of course, they're, there's no empirical evidence for those dimensions. It's formal, right? The, yes. It's yes. To, well, actually, now I have an interview that uh -huh. hasn't been released yet, okay. but it may be released yeah. soon, exactly on this topic, Excellent. string theory. And uh, there are some empirical Excellent. predictions made by string theory, as well as Excellent. very elegant mathematical proofs. Yes. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I mean about formal evidence. Yes. There's but formal evidence. Yes. Okay, good, good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited. So anyway, you have, so you have this paradox. It's like the paradox of like, I mean, science, like after quantum physics, right? Mm -hmm. has continued operating in a very Newtonian uh, way, you know, yes. with the whole decades of quantum physics around, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, there is something there that needs to happen. And of course, the number of contemporary scientists that are also more open-minded mm -hmm. also increasing with, yeah. by the way, you know, so, yes. Well, we, th we think of Newtonian 
physics mm -hmm. and sort of establishing this idea of the naturalistic worldview. Everything works like mm -hmm. a big clock yes. in Newtonian physics mm -hmm. and makes people feel very comfortable. But mm -hmm. Newton himself was bothered yes. by it because he, he knew that gravity mm -hmm. defied that kind of an interpretation. Gravity itself implies action at a distance. There was no way to explain <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it's been troubling scientists who look very carefully at, at the natural world ever since. Yes, exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. totally. So, so anyway, we are like full, full of mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a good, I think yeah. that's a, yes. Well, you know, there's no reason that I know of that science, the scientific method needs to be wedded mm -hmm. to any particular metaphysical position. I know there are mm -hmm. people who say we could just as easily say that consciousness is primary, that if we're going to be reductionistic, everything should be reduced to consciousness <laughs> rather than to quarks and uh, <laughs> electrons. Yes, it's like two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's, it's interesting in a way, of course, to reduce things to consciousness. Uh, it kind of solves the hard problem, right? Yeah. It dissolves the hard problem. <laughs> yeah, right. That from a materialistic perspective is like mm -hmm. unsolvable so far, you know? Yeah. So in a way it has an advantage, you know, like this yeah. kind of like whether it's animistic or pantheistic worldview. So, you know, uh, have an advantage in the sense that they dissolve the, one of the hardest problems of science, you know? And, and there's a yes. real movement now yes. in science for yes. scientists who, as you point out, have been meditating for 20 yes. years. Uh, I interviewed not long ago Marjorie Woolacott, uh -huh. a, a emeritus professor in neuroscience yes, at yes. the University of Oregon, who, who says, yes, we, we have to have a new metaphysics. We can be idealists exactly. and still do science. Exactly. Absolutely. And also you have like also many new cosmologists, even, yeah. you know, they're like, the last book I'm reading is by Ray Gold, uh, Cosmos in Creation. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful book. I mean, he's not, um, you know, a thing. Uh, he's not bringing any kind of like he's sort of operating from science, yes. but it's like basically saying you know like everything everything points to what that you know the universe from the very beginning had the building plan to produce life and yeah. consciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the universe in quite literal way as an organism, as an entity, mm -hmm. you know, versus like this collection of objects rules by these natural laws, you know, and like so from that to to this kind of worldviews, you mm -hmm. know, that more kind of animistic, organistic is like super close, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I see seeing is like, uh, I see like in, in contemporary science in so many fields, you know, like, uh, people bringing theories and models that, uh, they claim they're scientific, mm -hmm. you know, but they're getting closer and closer, you know, so I can see like uh, the reconciliation of, of aspects of science and aspects of more uh, uh, spiritual worldviews coming closer and closer. I, I think <clears throat> it's uh, not unreasonable to think that in the mm. coming decades, a uh, holistic vision of the universe, mm -hmm. a, an ecological vision, a vision that everything is interconnected and uh, in a sense alive, even mm -hmm. conscious, uh, will replace our uh, old-fashioned materialistic <laughs> view of, of things. I can see that happening. It might yes. happen faster than anybody realizes. Mm -hmm. In a way, you can see like the truth of that. Uh, I think it was Schopenhauer of one of those philosophers that say, well, the characteristics of a great truth is that first is smoked, later is kind of dismissed, yeah. and then later is just accepted as obvious. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We knew it all along. We knew it all along, <laughs> right? And you can see that a lot, you know, it's starting yeah. to happen. I mean, some hardcore scientists and philosophers like saying yeah. things like, wow, they're saying things that you know, a number of years ago, they were very resistant to these views. You know? Sure. Uh, so. And, and you, you can point out good reasons for holding mm -hmm. that view. You can go back to Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. for example, who, mm -hmm. who understood the mystery yes. <laughs> of gravity and, yes. and so on. Well, Jorge, mm -hmm. w again, what a pleasure to have pleasure a, of mine. such a conversation pleasure with of mine. you. I, uh, I expect that we'll be reaching out uh, to a younger generation of, of researchers and, and that your I words so. will uh, have a real impact. Thank you very much. Jeffrey. Thank you for being with me and thank you for being with us.